Building an Overwatch League team from scratch is, like, really hard. So many people assume that if you just take all of the people who are objectively the best at their positions, slap them all together, you get the best possible team. But it's just not that simple. After all, Overwatch players aren't robots who are going to play at 100% of their potential all the time. There are still a million things that can go wrong. People are going to have off days. People are going to be in bad moods. In Houston's case, people are going to get sick. And when times like this happen, the players on the team have to have the dedication and the tenacity to stick through it. They can't give in to the urge to blame each other and cause infighting. If they do, the team falls apart. At the same time, they can't become apathetic and just accept the losses, because again, the team falls apart. We've seen teams crack under the pressure multiple times, and that's why what the Guangzhou Charge managed to pull off in their debut season is all the more impressive. Let's talk about it. The Guangzhou Charge are owned by the Nanking Group, a Chinese-based conglomerate company that specializes in the fields of finance and entertainment. As far as their experience in sports, Nanking is most well known for their ownership of the Guangzhou Long Lions, a team that competes in the Chinese Basketball Association. While this team has never had much success in the CBA, they have been participating in the league for 20 years now, so there is a level of experience there. So to a company that's brand new to esports, who just spent many million dollars for a lot in this league, there are two basic routes you can go down when building your team. You can poach an entire contenders roster that has a lot of experience playing together at the expense of getting the objectively best players mechanically, or you could try and pick and choose a bunch of the brightest stars and hidden gems and bring them all together for the first time. This may give you a better team mechanically at the cost of having to build synergy from nothing. But Guangzhou kind of decided to do a hybrid of the two. Now, the core of this team was all coming from the same place, Metabellum. This team, and the overarching organization Meta Gaming, has been a mainstay in competitive Overwatch all the way back to the beginning. Their first team, Meta Athena, came in fourth place in Contender Season 2, with a lineup that included future Overwatch League players like Saya Player, Libero, Chris, and Nuss. More recently, though, their second team, Metabellum, was coming off a streak of very good performances, finishing as semi-finalists in both seasons of Contenders Korea 2018. This is where the charge found their entire coaching staff of Jin, Taidola, and Jungwoo, as well as many of their players. This included main tank Ryo, hitscan DPS Happy, and the support duo of Rise and Chara. This core of players was quite well respected, especially Happy, who was considered possibly the best Widowmaker and Contenders at the time. Poke out, fights oh the shot, God. Happy gets climax in midair, overtime is ticking away. O2 already didn't have to be in onto the point, Celebrate with his pulse bomb, can definitely open things up, but he's another not gonna one. have a chance to use it! Happy finds another shot, he's putting the team on his back, he gets climax again! Shutting down O2 here on Volskaya, Violet dead, they trade one back, Chara's gonna fall, but Happy is just filling the kill feed with these shots! But in order to supplement this crew of newbies, Hoppa was acquired from the Philadelphia Fusion. While Hoppa wasn't necessarily the starter for the Fusion over Poco, he is a very impressive player, known for his aggressive D.Va playstyle and his ability to flex to most DPS heroes. This was a really good move. Hoppa had the opportunity to start on a brand new team and would provide a much needed veteran presence. But then things got kind of weird. First, the charge looked to the North American contenders team, Toronto Esports. This is where they picked up flex support Shu and flex DPS Nero. Shu made a lot of sense as a promising flex support prospect, but Nero? Not only was he an American on a completely Korean roster up to this point, but he was underage. Nero wouldn't even be able to play until stage 3. Then, as possibly an attempt to appeal to their Chinese audience, the team picked up Eileen and Only Wish from LGD Gaming in Chinese contenders. Now, in the past, Eileen was thought of as one of the best players to come out of China, but this was mostly from his performances in the 2017 Overwatch World Cup, which may as well have been a century ago in esports time. Then, if that wasn't enough, the team also picked up Kib from the British Hurricane in contenders Europe. Look, none of these players are bad. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that all of them are actually really good and deserve to be in Overwatch League. But you have to understand that after Season 1, a lot of people thought that the Shanghai Dragons failed to win a game in the second half because they struggled to bring a bilingual roster together. Then the Charge walked up and were like, 
two languages, that's nothing, and put together a trilingual roster. In a game like Overwatch, where teamwork really is paramount, having players coming in Korean, Chinese, and English is a huge issue that the team had to find a solution to and fast. So while the charge had a lot of good pieces, most people didn't trust them to put them together. That's why they were usually placed between 11th and 15th in the preseason power rankings. So Guangzhou took the stage, and they weren't bad. They weren't necessarily good, but they weren't too bad either. As it turns out, Guangzhou's solution to having a trilingual roster was to only have to deal with two languages at a time. Five out of the six players on stage for Guangzhou at this point were always Korean. The exception to this rule was the flex DPS slot. On maps where the team wanted to play hard meta, which meant Brig, they would usually put in Kib. However, Eileen would come in on maps where the team wanted to play off-meta heroes like Sombra. The team was constantly swapping between an English speaker and a Chinese speaker, so the fact that they were able to slot in so smoothly with an otherwise Korean lineup is actually quite impressive, even if the DPS aren't the ones making heavy calls. The team, as a whole, was fairly mediocre at this point, but the exception, and the person who deserves a shoutout, is Shu. While Moira or Zen Goats were the two most common Goats variants at the time, the charge played Ana more than most, and when you watched Shu, you understood why. The dude was nutty with his sleeps and his antinates, and his Zenyatta was really good too. Shu popped off early on in the season, and was honestly a candidate for Rookie of the Year at this point. In a pool of fantastic flex support players, this is a huge accomplishment. When you look at the overall stage though, it was… alright. Guangzhou would go 3-4 and four this stage, which was respectable, especially since two of those losses were against the Titans, the eventual Sage champions. Actually, it's worth mentioning that one of these games was actually really close. It went to a map 5, and the charge would have won it if it weren't for a clutch grav bomb at the very last second. The charge gave fans some promising moments to keep them hopeful, but it ultimately wasn't enough to make the stage playoffs. And unfortunately, the charge took a step back in stage 2, but I don't think it's necessarily because the charge were worse. I just think their opponents were better. Not only did they have to face teams like the Spark, the Gladiators, and the Shock twice, which, by the way, this is the second time that the charge had to face the eventual stage champions twice, but also, I think the element of surprise that the charge had originally was gone. Their opponents now understood that they had to put pressure on Shu, and once he was occupied, they were free to hard pressure Ryo until he eventually fell. This rendered the charge essentially useless in Goat's Mirror matchups against good teams. Except when they played Doomfist Goats. Yeah, you heard me right. In Stage 2, the Guangzhou Charge experimented with a variation of Goats in which Eileen played Doomfist instead of the usual Zarya. This was trusting Eileen to do a lot of damage, and boy did he deliver. While the charge would only do this strategy on very specific maps, it is worth mentioning because they were the only team to really do this, and it worked well when they did. While this could be viewed as a futile attempt to break out of the meta, showing Guangzhou's overall dissatisfaction with GOATS, I do have to give the team props for trying their best to think outside of the box and coming up with new strategies. With a 2-5 overall record in Stage 2, the Charge would once again not be making the Stage playoffs. Overall, the team was still really mediocre in a GOATS meta, and something needed to change fast if the team was going to contend for the playoffs. Hey, guess what? In Stage 3, the Guangzhou Charge played the Shanghai Dragons twice. Guess who ended up winning the Stage? Seriously! Like, what is this voodoo magic? Anyways, the main difference between stages 2 and 3 for the charge was Nero coming of age and making his Overwatch League debut. To be honest, I wasn't too sure if the Flex DPS player would end up on the stage at all. While he waited to turn 18, Nero played for Guangzhou Academy in Contenders China, and it went… not very well. But he soon took over the Flex DPS role full-time, basically as he turned 18. It took a few games, probably due to stage nerves, but Nero quickly became a respected Flex DPS player, with both his Brig play in GOATS and his Farah play outside of it. For the most part, however, the charge didn't really change too much. They were still pretty mediocre, and while they did go 4-3, and three, I would say that's more because of an easier schedule, not necessarily because the team was better. 
Guangzhou failed to qualify for the stage playoffs again, and were left on the outside looking in for the overall playoffs. It's worth mentioning that between stages 3 and 4, the Charge completed a three-way trade with the Fusion and the Gladiators. For the Charge, this meant that they sent Kib over to Philly and gained a new tank line in Fraggy from the Fusion and Bishu from the Gladiators. While these are two very well-liked players, like their personalities are awesome, this trade ended up being inconsequential for the Charge. Kid wasn't going to play anymore anyways now that Nero was 18, and it was too late in the season to completely swap your tank duo. Fraggy and Bushu would only play one map for the charge in a garbage time map 4. No, this trade wouldn't be the answer that the charge were looking for. So what was the answer? Roll lock. Yeah, of all the teams predicted the benefit from the death of goats, I can't say that Guangzhou was at the top of that list, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. While the Charge were never terrible at goats, you can't deny that they always looked better when allowed to play on the comfort picks. I'm talking Nero on Farah or Genji, Eileen on Somber or Doomfist, Happy on Widow. This is when Guangzhou looked the most explosive, and in stage 4, they were unleashed. How aggressively are they? Oh, they're playing it super aggressively. They're doing it. Nobody would have expected the EMP to be there. Full team EMP. This is this is Guangzhou charge using a pick composition here very effectively. So pulling members of London Spitfire into those sidelines, and they keep Another getting one. kills. Important right here that you have a lot more barrier damage with the storm arrows from Hanzo as well as the Roadhog fire. So they can sort of just play it up front with this. Oh, happy! Oh, and immediately the hack on the Lucio. Uh, the position for the charge is annoying. They're just going to drop down and make it half a Kalahex to get any advantage. Kalahex is just a spear on the wall at this stage. The Nero brings a fist down. That is filthy. Emboldened by their DPS, the charge looked like a completely new team. Gone was the indecisiveness that they showed in GOATS. They knew how they wanted to play around the picks from their DPS, and they played it extremely well. The Guangzhou Charge would go 6-1 this stage, and this wasn't against easy opponents either. We're talking wins against playoff teams like the Fusion, the Spark, and the Dynasty, and a 4-0 destruction against the New York Excelsior. The Charge would have been the third seed in the stage for playoffs if such a thing existed. However, thanks to their fantastic performance in this stage, the Charge managed to finish the season with an overall record of 15 and 13, good enough to jump all the way up to the ninth seed. Guangzhou had earned a chance at postseason glory with all of the momentum in the world, and if the Spitfire in Season 1 was any indication, there's nothing scarier in the playoffs than a team on a hot streak. As a ninth seed in the play-ins bracket, the Charge's first postseason game was against the 12th seed, the Hunters. And yeah, this game wasn't particularly close. The Charge dominated by doing the exact same thing that they did in Stage 4, playing their comfort picks. We saw Shu on Ana, Eileen on Doomfist, and especially Nero on Farah. I mean, just look at that stat line. Combine that with Hoppa playing a very good Sigma, and the Hunters stood no chance. They were simply outmatched. So the Charge moved on, and the only team standing between them and a spot in the top 8 was the Seoul Dynasty. This game also wasn't particularly close, but unfortunately, it was the other way around. The Dynasty had obviously done their research on Guangzhou and their signature comp, and came out ready to counter it. Or, to be more accurate, Fleta was ready to counter it. This is exactly what Nero is supposed to be doing. Using cover to get to to like close the distance he uses cover to close the distance then when he's close he shoots the ever loving shit out of Fletter while he's getting pressured Fletter's 41 HP and he decides nah fam I'm just gonna triple tap you quad tap you he's 14 health Nero's Farah, which I think still shows up in the nightmares of Hunter's players was completely shut down by Fletter's McCree because he just hit every single shot Nero had no choice but to respect it, and just like that, the Charge were forced out of their comfort zone, and everything fell apart from there. 
Guangzhou lost this game 4-1 and bowed out of Overwatch League Season 2 in 9th place overall. To be frank, for me personally, the Guangzhou Charge have been the most difficult team to write a script for. Why? Because from my point of view, up until Stage 4, there wasn't that much that was too special about them. They were just kinda there, in the middle of the pack, pretty quiet personalities, didn't make many moves. There honestly wasn't too much to write about. But is that truly a bad thing? Sure, in a GOATS meta the Charge weren't great, but they weren't bad either. Considering all of the issues they had to work through with languages, and possibly the most teamwork-reliant meta in Overwatch's history, the fact that the team didn't completely explode was honestly pretty impressive. Then of course Rollock came around, and the DPS of the charge finally got credit for just how great they can be. While they didn't get too far in the playoffs, the Guangzhou charge gave fans a lot to look forward to next season, and because of that, I view it as a success. That's why my final grade for the Guangzhou charge in Season 2 of the Overwatch League is a B. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed looking back at Guangzhou's season as much as I did. How do you think the charge will perform in season 3? Let me know in the comments. As always, leave a like on this video if you liked it, and if you want to be notified for every new video I put out, make sure to subscribe with that notification bell on. Let's see who our next victims will be. Oh no. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said victims before I spun the wheel. Oh, it's time to bring the mayhem. Sorry, man. Until then, though, don't get tilted.